Thank you. So, yeah, this is like a moment which is really awkward usually, and I can feel it's still awkward. I thought maybe it will not. But, you know, like standing here, just being all my own, you are somewhere there, and, and I'm scaring myself. I'm scaring myself thinking that, well, you're great agile coaches, scrum masters, and I'm not. <laughs> so I know the concepts more or less. Um, I've been working with companies who mostly work with those concepts, but never being the one actually myself. So I scare myself thinking that you know more than I do about the topic. <laughs> I scare myself thinking that you're actually already have an opinions about the topic I'm going to be talking about and that you're not agreeing with me and, you know, we like to be approved. <laughs> so we scare ourselves and I think that this is actually um, something very natural to us human beings when we are leaders, change makers, internal, external to the organization and there's a challenge, there's a problem, there's an issue, there's a tension in the organization and you know, like we feel like we want to fix it, we want to resolve it, and we have some ideas about it, and we feel observed. <laughs> People expect things from us, so there's a tension and there's a stress which we rarely address. And when I'm thinking about how we approach searching for solutions, there are usually two ways, and the way that most of the change agents choose, including me, <laughs> is just going the way problem, solution. Problem, there's a tension, I feel stressed, like, oh, what do we do? There's a pressure from the client, there's a pressure from the board, pressure from people, pressure from everybody. So the quickest we can release the tension, the better. So we turn to frameworks. There's other way, <laughs> which, from my experience working on transformations, um, I know that this is the least like, chosen one. And it means that we have a question, we have a problem and tension, again, and we formulate this question precisely and hold it. We don't answer, we stay in the tension, we allow things to emerge. And this is something that we don't like to do. However, if we don't go this path, we usually miss out on some very, very important elements, the nitty-gritty that actually at the end cause us to think, oh, the framework is really wrong. And I have to say that I really love frameworks. I fell in love with the first framework in 2016, and that was holacracy, <laughs> you already mentioned. I was searching for different ways of working. I didn't know what that means at that time, because I just left a corporate where I really hated how we were doing things. So I was searching for different ways. And I read the book by Frederick Laloux, Reinventing Organizations. Um, if you don't know the book, it is there in the library, so you can check it out. And there was this beautiful framework, um, Holacracy. And Holacracy, as many frameworks do, promises clarity, direction, you know, it promises that things will be efficient, that we'll have better, quicker decisions. And yeah, <laughs> that's how it starts, with promises. And obviously, me loving the frameworks, and I'm losing loads of frameworks on a daily basis, we all do, uh, I believe that there is a lot of truth and the things that we can learn from them, yet, when I've been observing organizations on my path, and since this 2016, I certified myself in Holacracy, I teamed up with Austrian companies so we could experiment together different frameworks and check what works, what's not, and then implement it to clients. That was a lot of fun. And on this path, I realized that there's something wrong. Like every time, organization was putting a lot of effort, time, focus and money to implement the framework. And it didn't really matter how much of the focus and the time and the effort they were putting. 
at the end, the problems stayed the same. I'm not saying exactly the same. There were some improvements, yet, let's take Holacracy uh, as an example. Holacracy is a framework that says, well, we're going to remove hierarchy, the power of people over people. So there will be no one telling you what to do, no authority that can actually make you do things. And at the same time, after years of practicing or months of implementing, we were finding out that there is still a shadow hierarchy in place. There are still these dynamics that even though this person is not a CEO anymore, has different roles, yet we feel like there is hierarchy. So, because I also like a lot of alternative approaches to the world, <laughs> and I do a lot of work with individual clients and leaders especially, so that I can help them understand the context they are in on a little bit deeper levels, like their subconscious minds, uh, things that we are not aware of and we don't even know that they exist, but they still get in our way. Um, so I started observing those patterns in organizations uh, a little bit more closely and from a different angle. And there are loads of conclusions I'm having. <laughs> I'm just going to share with you three, one, three of them, um, as the time probably allows for that. And, yeah, and I guess I'm going to start <laughs> with the first one. And the first problem that I noticed on this path is that we're actually not really aware of our unconscious patterns. We use systemic thinking, we map things, but we actually many times do it very on the surface level. And you probably many times saw when teams are doing retrospectives, they just stay on the surface level, like let's not touch something which is deeper. And we just don't know how to look on these underlying patterns. And the interesting thing for me is that, well, I know by my experience that our choices are driven by our unconscious beliefs, these unconscious patterns. So how it works, actually, because it's also about the framework. So we also choose frameworks based on our blind spots, unconscious patterns. And to give you an example of mine, um, I holacris about you know, removing the hierarchy. And after some time, I noticed that most of my life was about, well, rebelling against hierarchy, against authority. I wanted things to do my way. I didn't want anybody to tell me how to do things. And there was another side to that, <laughs> which was actually funnier, because, you know, like when you're trying to make a revolution and you're the one that's fighting for something, you actually become the same. So there is still a part of me that I would say always wanted to be a dictator. You know, like, I'm going to tell people what to do. So this inner dynamic was there. I was not aware of that. And I was obviously drawn to holacracy. Um, so then I observed the whole community of teal organizations and self-organization, holacracy. And I have to tell you that this is so common. So I'm not going to go into when you're drawn to Agile, what it means, and what's your blind spot, but I believe every of you can check that out. And obviously, this is a very abstract concept, you know, like, okay, so what to do with that? You know, I cannot apply this in my team or organization, like, you know, how to search for blind spots. And yes, there is a way. I use systemic thinking, systemic um, retrospectives and analysis and diagnosis just to dive deeper, but you don't need to go that far. You can actually make an exercise with me. And the exercise is that there is an idea that I really resonate with, that we know what we are committed to by the results we are getting. So just to give you an example, I know that I don't want my back to hurt. And this is a real example. But it still does. And I would say, like, oh, I do so many things so that my back is not hurting, and at the same time, it still do hurt. So, 
it means that some, some kind, uh, some, in some way, I'm unconsciously committed to that. And we can actually make an exercise, so I can show you how it goes. I would need you to take a piece of paper or a phone and open an app that you can make some notes. And I promise I will not ask you to uh, say it aloud. <laughs> so if you can open up something that you can write just for you. Yeah? So the question is simple, the first one. What are you complaining about most in your life? Just one thing. It doesn't have to be big. My back problems. Yeah, I'm complaining that my back is hurting. And just pick up one thing. And now, imagine, today is Friday, and just play the game and complete the sentence. Today is Friday, and the truth is I'm unconsciously committed to dot, dot, dot. In my case, today is Friday, and I'm unconsciously committed to having a back pain. And, you know, like, even if I know it, I still feel a little bit of resistance. I feel still like, oh, come on, I do so many things. I'm not committed to that. Yet, I have the result. So, that's the third question. And actually, this is the most fun when you do it with teams. And now, teach us. Teach us how to get exactly this result. So, um, in my case, how to get the back pain. First, don't exercise for years. Just, you know, avoid any kind of movement for some years so your muscles can be really weak. Then, work a lot and sit in a very uncomfortable chair so that your muscles will squeeze and it's going to be even easier to get the result. And work a lot, obviously, and don't move. And if you would think about any walking or swimming, avoid it. That this is like forbidden. Never do that again. Um, and obviously, put a lot of pressure on yourself that you need to do things perfectly, that you cannot make mistakes, etc., etc. And this is the recipe. This is how you do that. And it's really fun when you do that with teams, because team says, you know, third retrospective, and they say like, oh, we're not delivering on time, again and again and again and again. And this is not because of us, it's because of the clients, it's because of the market, it's because of the shitty software we're having or whatever. So put them in teams, small teams, and ask them those questions, and let them work on the answers. And you will see, and they will see, that they actually are creating this reality more than they think. And they are not at the effect of everything around. These are the things that I can, they actually control. And this is really, really fun. So I'm not asking you to tell your story, <laughs> but if you have your thought, your complaint in your phone, I really encourage you to do this exercise at home. The second thing that I've observed is that we're not following our highest excitement and least resistance. So we're not following excitement, we're following a resistance, so we're focusing all the time on no, of what's not working, me included. Um, my first talent in Gallup is restorative, meaning I love searching for problems and resolving them. And yeah, I get lots of energy doing that, <laughs> yet <laughs> this is not very helpful in many cases. And uh, what it really means in transformation processes, what I observed, is that we really need to focus on where the team has the least resistance to check, to experiment with something, where they really feel excited about solving a problem, because they were going to do that really quickly, without much effort, and they're going to have results. If you do it the other way around, they're going to be struggling, procrastinating, and you're going to be wondering, like, oh, why it's not working again. And I have did that, obviously, quite some times <laughs> before I learned the lesson, that this is a really easy way to actually check if we do have resistance to something and how to deal with it, I will tell you later, and if we have highest excitement. And this is something we obviously also don't like to think about, especially when we are in business and dealing with money and time and expectations. So science know that there are three brains, not only one. One in our mind, in our head, one in our heart and our gut. They're all nervous systems that work very similarly. 
And one of the things, the easiest way, if you master recognizing your emotions and feelings, is to actually check if you're in alignment. And you can do it with yourself, with every decision you make. Check if my mind creates some thoughts that are contradicting. If you have any feelings that are like fear or anger or whatever, the negative ones. And your instinct is telling you, yes, go for it, or no, don't go for it, it's dangerous. And you can do it on your own with every decision and check where you are, and you can do it with the team so that everybody can check that. And out of those informations, because this is data, and I really use this with my teams in the companies as data, we check what feelings we are having about the problem, about the solution. And when we dig into that, we actually realize there's just so many information that we can learn from this so that we can resolve the problems that we are having. And one of the easiest, maybe, is fear. So many times when we implement any kind of framework, any change, we try to do something new, people will fear. This is very natural, very normal, and it's not a matter of ignoring it. It's not about firing people who are resisting, <laughs> as many would like to. It's not about you know, trying to tell them how it is and why it is like that and try them to understand only with their minds because their bodies are saying, no, <laughs> this is scary. And this is one thing that we as leaders, coaches, facilitators can do to make our lives easier is to understand that there are three reasons why we fear there are three needs, basic needs, that are not met when we are facing changes. And the first one is control. So when I go to companies that want to go self-organized, teal, um, there's usually a lot of fear of losing control. You know, I was a CEO, I'm an owner, and now you're telling me that the way to go is to let go of the power. Yes, <laughs> this is what you said you want, but I'm afraid. Yeah, I'm afraid I'm going to lose control and I'm going to get bankrupt because those people don't know how to do things. So, second thing is security. In most of the transformation processes, this is very scary for people because they don't know if there's going to be a place for them. And when we go teal and we say like, hey, check out, do you really want to do the things you're doing? Or maybe you hate that you're procrastinating, you're not doing it well, maybe you can let it go and somebody else will do that. People get really scared because they feel like, oh, it's not going to be place for me now. So that's sometimes causing the resistance and causing difficulties in pursuing the transformation. And the third one is approval. We want to be liked. We want to be approved of, you know, like we put a lot of energy in things we were doing, we were leaders, we were on the top, you know, we could tell people how to do things, we had the answers, and now it's like, no, 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 back off, you know, like, don't go there, just let people figure it out. And we're like, well, I like that, people liked me, they appreciated me for that, what am I going to do? Like, I'm not going to be approved anymore. So, if we know that control, security, and approval is actually things that cause resistance, we can start addressing that. And we can start addressing that in a number of ways. Um, yesterday we had a talk about psychological safety. Today now is a workshop about that. So there are loads of ideas how to do that. And if we are not facing that and not getting to understand why people are afraid of the change, any framework None of the frameworks will really work for you. And the third point that I wanted to bring is that we're not really knowing how to resolve conflicts. And if I was to choose the one thing that every organization that's going through change should really invest time, money, resources to do, to learn how to do, is resolving conflicts. We are so afraid to be honest. We're so afraid just to speak openly. We're so afraid that, you know, whatever we'll do, this will come back, <laughs> we're not going to be approved, secure, or we're going to lose control, that we really, you know, like, withdraw. 
And we withhold many information, and you know that from your experience, like people knowing the problems but never speaking up. And probably you know this very well. I love very simple models that fit on one page that you know we can remember and apply to many things. And the nice thing about conflict, for me at least, um, because I'm more intuitive and not so much mental, <laughs> is that if we argue about the content, which is above the water level, what, who, when, where, we're always going to be in argument. It's like we can spend days and hours and months and years arguing about things, what's right and wrong, and being even more like, oh, this is right and this is wrong, and hate each other because of that, not realizing that what we're actually arguing about is something completely different. And we are arguing about what is below the waterline. I'm sure you know that. We're arguing about how do we actually perceive the content? Um, what's our relationship with the content? And this is, has, it is not an arguable discussion there, because if I say, well, I'm afraid, <laughs> that is, if we implement that, we're going to be really in trouble, well, this is my fear. This is unarguable. Like, I'm just afraid, and that's it. And when we go there, really below, we can actually figure it out why we are not agreeing with each other, and we can find a different solution. And we spoke about it that, well, it's said that Einstein said that, you know, you cannot solve problems from the level of consciousness that where it was created. And this is actually the way to expand the consciousness and get out of your boxes and the team's boxes to realize that let's put aside the content and let's see what's below. Let's see what we are actually feeling, sensing, what are our thoughts that are passing by that make us get into the agreement. And there is a very simple tool as well called facts versus stories that you can use with your teams. And, you know, like, I'm really um, many times surprised because we know those tools and practices, and the simpler they are, the biggest results they are having, yet we're waiting for something really big and complex and complicated and multi-leveled so that it will help us to resolve the problem. And just a simple exercise like that, versus fact, facts versus stories, can actually make the team realize where the problem is and what we are arguing about. And this is the easiest way also to resolve conflicts. So facts, what a video camera would record, stories, what I make up about the facts. Um, and if you see this picture, that's me four years ago, more or less this time. What are the facts about me on this picture? No hair. That's a fact. <laughs> yeah. What else? Smile. What else? Thank you. Yeah. More or less, yeah? No hair, smile, orange blouse. And what are the stories? What are you making up when you look at that? Yeah? She's happy, maybe. Mm -hmm. What the? Yeah, she's ill. I got that. You know, like, I had a meeting in the morning with my client before I did that, and I told him, like, if I look okay, I'm going to post it. If I don't, I'm not. <laughs> so you will know. But I'm going to do that. So I post it, and other than the post, you know, there are people, like, commenting, and somebody wrote to me, like, Hey, are you okay? I'm like, yeah. Oh, I was afraid that you have cancer. That was a big interpretation. What else? I'm curious if you're going to hit the third. Ah, good one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm brave. Yeah, that's also true. <laughs> so the third thing that I heard, and that was like biggest surprise, is that I got invitation to a Buddhist event. 
And I was like, what happened there? Like, I'm like, oh, orange, no hair. Yeah, I'm a monk. I was like, oh, cool. I didn't know. Um, and that was like a really far interpretation, you know, like having a cancer and being a monk. And this is exactly what we do. We say, well, Agile is not working. And we say, Scrum not working, Holacracy not working, this is not working. You know, things are not working, and they're not working for us <laughs> because we're not looking at the facts, and we are just thinking that the facts are stories. Um, and I love this exercise to do it with teams and also with people who are in conflict because they can really realize like, what are the interpretations they're making. And when we know the interpretations, then we can really focus on what is behind interpretations because these are the emotions, the fears, and what are the facts really. And we can focus on the facts and try to resolve them. And that's really much quicker, even though those exercises I'm um, uh, offering you are not really very comfortable at the beginning. So, facts don't cause suffering and conflicts. It's our stories, our judgments, our opinions, and our emotions that are behind. And this is the simplest clearing model ever that I wanted to give you so that we don't have to make things so complicated. <laughs> Um, when you have any thought that appeared more than three times, or you're still thinking it a day after, and that's a little bit of conflicting one, it could be with yourself, <laughs> it could be with others, with a team, with the management board, with anybody. Just put the facts and stories on the paper. Really on the paper, not on your head, because your head will just still mess around with that. What are the facts? What are the stories? And just go and say it. This is the fact. You shaved your hair. The story I make up is you, you have cancer. I want to check out my story. You know, like, that's much easier, and I think a soft way and a very kind way just to confront each other and just not stay with the conflict and not build up the tension until it's really hard to resolve it, and just to catch it in the moment. So, um, I said at the beginning, I love frameworks, and I don't think that they dupe you. I think that we are actually duping ourselves, and by all these three things, doing them or avoiding doing them, not seeing our blind spots, hidden patterns within us, team, organization, not following our highest excitement at work, and just allowing others to tell us what we should do, even if we hate it, and just keep on resisting, and not being really honest with each other, not resolving conflicts and not building those skills, we can really then say, if we're not doing that, that frameworks are crap and they don't work. And if you'd like to, I almost forgot about that, if you'd like to listen a little bit more about what to do when you want to go teal, self-organize, in a more practical way. Um, well, I find this what I said practical, but still I know that we need very detailed um, some, some instructions and experiences. This is the podcast that I uh, co-host with my ex-client I've been working with, which is called Orientuj się. You know, like, um, you need to be on the top of information really to know how to do things. And it's available almost everywhere now also on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you very much.